at long last. Here we are once again, torn into pieces with seemingly barely functional audio equipment, which doesn't make a lick o sense, but you know how it be. Regardless, welcome to this, our Lord's Day, 37th episode of the Dungeon Bros Podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. But... We play the we play in dungeons with with some dragons from time to time. We, we do play both games, the dungeons and the dragons. We also been known to gather magic from time to time. We do pick it up and put it down. Slap it around. Shake it like a Polaroid picture. Oh, I don't know about that. You know you're not supposed to shake them. Yeah, Polaroid had to come out uh, af- with a statement after uh, uh, the song "Hey Ya" was released, saying, "No, no, 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 don't don't shake a Polaroid picture." Why not? Like uh, what? Like it. How does it hurt? I think, like, since, you know, it's setting the chemicals on it, like, if you shake it, it could blur the picture, basically, like, by having the chemicals shift around. The I, the, I find that hilarious, that the idea that the Polaroid, that the Polaroid picture is actually a much nicer image than what we've been led to believe. <laughs> that, like... No one's following the rules of Polaroid, yeah. and yeah. thus, and thus, like the the classic. Oh, this is a really crappy image from our nine from our eighties and nineties is just a mis a misconception, and that they have crystal clear. <laughs> they had the technology for crystal clear photos. Exactly, exactly. That that would be that would be how that works for sure. But with all of that being said, we found a new trend that we've created. Apparently. <laughs> It's not really a trend. It's just uh, it was two. It was two really well performing TikToks followed by two really not well performing TikToks that don't make any sense why they performed so much worse than the other ones. But I digress. Uh, the fans fans of the show fans of Magic the Gathering even mm-hmm. most probably familiar with the Yu Gi Oh anime. Mm, yeah, a lot of people, especially around our age, are absolutely and. We ourselves were fans of the Yu-Gi-Oh anime once upon a time. Oh yes, absolutely. When it was releasing way back in the in the late '90s, early 2000s. And uh, we've done we've done a series of TikToks of varying levels of success of us playing Magic: The Gathering and and explaining it all in gross, unnecessary detail, <laughs> much like the Yu-Gi-Oh anime. <laughs> Uh, maybe our problem is we haven't broken enough rules we have the of the actual game that they're playing that is true we have not broken nearly enough magic the gathering rules for that to be accurate to the program if you will but you should check those out on our tiktok we have an entire playlist and they're fucking hilarious they're they are our magnum opus in many ways i hope not and you can actually hear us speak, which is something we don't often do in videos. We do it in lives all the time, but yeah. Um, I'm thinking, I've been playing more Magic Arenas, also. I to... I have not. I've thought about it, but then every time I go to open it up, I'm like, oh, it logged me out since I've been out for so long, and I don't care to go look at my password. <laughs> That's your only barrier of entry. <laughs> Kinda, yeah. Right now. Wow. I'm lazy. That's. That's like that's that's literally like you can't punch your way out of a paper bag kind of sitch. I'm not, yeah, well, it'd it's... be like that, I guess. I mean, I I'm enjoying it. I've been playing I've been playing standard and I've been doing ranked, which is not something I usually do. I'm just trying to do some. We're, we've been trying to do things other than commander when it comes to the magic. We have been playing a lot of, especially one on one commander or yeah. brawl or, or dual commander, whatever you want to call it. Um, but so yeah, a little different format. Gotta gotta keep it fresh. Gotta switch up from time to time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, for sure, for sure. That's why we started doing the Jumpstart streams. Mm-hmm. The Jumpstart 2022. Wonderful set. Wonderful set. You buy two packs, you shuffle them up. You're immediately able to play. It's got all the lands included. It highly highly recommend. Highly recommend. Um, hopefully we don't get banned. Yeah. And by we, I mean the entirety of TikTok. The entirety of TikTok. Everything sucks. <laughs> As it as is, I think one of the few through lines of the entire run of this podcast is just everything is awful. Every yeah, really. Once we just constantly. Maybe it's because before the podcast, we didn't look as much into these things that we look into now, or pay attention to things we pay attention to. Yeah. But now that we look and we see everything, it's uh, it just kind of sucks it, all the time. <laughs> I'd rather be blissfully ignorant. And yet here we are blissfully unblissfully aware unblissfully aware for sure uh 
Things that you should be unblissfully aware of, of course, are the upcoming releases from D&D and Magic the Gathering. We have Bigby Presents The Glory of Giants is coming in the spring. The Fandelver campaign book, untitled thus far, as well as The Book of Many Things are coming out at some point in the summer of 2023. I'm surprised we haven't gotten the Bigby book yet. Kinda, we're, cl- yeah. we're at the end of March. We haven't even seen much ado about it. Not really. Not really. And Keys to the Golden Vault like just came out, too. So that's a whole other thing. And then we're getting a Planescape book in the fall for the Dungeons & Dragons on the side of Magic the Gathering. Sam. On Magic the Gathering, we have March of the Machines releasing next month, April 21st, uh, followed by the Lord of the Rings Universes Beyond full set uh, being released in June of this year, June 23rd. And then they're going to have a second holiday release coming up in November, uh, November 3rd. Also Lord of the Rings. Also for Lord of the Rings. Just because. Um <laughs> And then uh, August fourth, uh, August fourth of this year will be the Commander Masters set release. Not gonna lie, I really only care about the Lord of the Rings set. If I'm being completely honest, like they, I'm, I'm somewhat intrigued by what's going on with March of the Machines. There's gonna be some a lot of really good reprints that hopefully drive down the price of things from Commander Masters. But Commander Masters is so unbelievably expensive right now, yes. like well before pre-order period or any cards have been shown. And uh, March of the Machines, I'm not gonna not gonna lie, not really pumped about in any meaningful way. I I think I'm I'm interested in several cards um, that we've seen, but spoiler season technically starts tomorrow, where we'll get a lot more of the set mechanics. Um, though there have been leaks about one of the mechanics already um, from a uh, third party publisher uh, uh, wrote an article about it. Um, and released it today instead of tomorrow. But Oops. that being said, um, yeah, yeah. And then plane Commander chase. Masters is, is it plane chase? It's the plane, yeah, the planes, yeah, the, plane. the battle mechanic. It's the battle, the battle. Mechanic. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we got to see a not super thrilling but. a siege card. We're not entirely sure what the mechanics are behind it, but we will find out probably more tomorrow. Yeah. So when this when this goes live, um, when this podcast goes live on the YouTube's and podcast services around the globe. I might add around the globe. We will probably know more, but that, but we're by that point, this will be outdated. So lull, <laughs> we are recording this the night before we post or the afternoon before we would post, uh, because D and D direct live stream. I don't want to talk about it right now. So I'm going to talk about the Lord of the Rings set. <laughs> <laughs> Wish we hadn't waited is my point there, but the Lord of the Rings set, um, We'll go into more detail afterwards, but it's really just taking my entire mindset of Magic the Gathering, both in the arenas game and in paper. I really just want to like skip everything till we get to Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, like there's a there's a they're doing a Shadows over Innistrad remastered on arenas right now. That's like oh, there's a lot of cool cards in there, and like I've got a Tovalar deck that's werewolf and some vampire stuff that I would love. But it's like I'd rather just save all my resources right now, get a couple March of the Machine things just to kind of keep my collection updated, and then uh, spend all of it on Lord of the Rings because Lord of the Rings is gonna be the first universes beyond set. It is also released on Magic, Magic Arenas, which yes. is ludicrous. They're just trying to take all of my money. They've been doing trying to do that for a while, and now you're just... They have the right incentive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which really sucks, because I also bought a car recently, so it's not like I'm swimming in cash anymore. No, but I'm you're... not swimming in dollary dues. That's, that's how that goes. Yeah. I've never swum in dollary dues, as much as I would have liked. But sadly, we do need to talk about the D&D Direct finished about an hour ago lasted a little over 30 minutes really a waste of our time yeah (laughs) being completely honest um we're gonna hit the major points here but yeah overall it could have been either individual release like individual blog posts or individual videos that they put out for each one um or they could have just not even worried about it most of these yeah I, the the recap article that they have would have sufficed for what they were talking about especially because they have the attached video trailers mm-hmm. and that would have been more than adequate but we're just going to go down the line in the order uh listed in the recap article which is basically the same order as um the D direct itself first up minecraft dungeons and dragons it's a full-on collaboration dlc 
creating the Forgotten Realms in Minecraft, giving up a level up mechanic, collecting loot. You can face off against uh, various D&D monsters in Minecraft, Displacer Beast, Gelatinous Cubes, Mimics, Beholders, etc. Dragons. Of course, there's going to be dragons. Always dragons. Always and dragons. And dragons. Uh, honestly, one of the cooler things of the Direct. Yeah, I, I think it was a good, uh, strong lead off uh, just because... These the two major properties that most people absolutely out of the field, adore. yeah. Um, and the they wrote it looks really good. They showed some gameplay of it hypothetically, um, but we don't know too many more details other than that at this time. I have I have found myself for many a years jumping back into Minecraft every year or two. This might be this might be the thing that just might push you right over. Yeah, I I understand that Minecraft pops up, it's, it rears its head every now and then. Every and now says, and again, hey, hey, remember me? I'm still free. I have I have I, you you already own me. Yeah, that's why you're free. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can also get the Minecraft Monstrous Compendium on D and D Beyond, which creates stat blocks for various uh, Minecraft monsters, including the Ender Dragon, Enderman, Creepers. Uh, the wolf in the overworld, which is the exact same stat just block. A wolf. It's just a wolf stat it's block. Just a wolf. It's got pack tactics and a bite. And that's it. That's, yeah. So volume three of the Monsters Compendium, Compendium is now out, and it features Minecraft monsters. They're making real good use of that. Uh, we, got another, we got another trailer for D&D Honor Among Thieves. I'm kind of over talking about, talking about it until we see the movie. It is coming out this weekend. As of the release, is going to be on Friday, March 31st. It actually is coming out. It's not being delayed again. No. So uh, we'll see if we need, we need, we'll need to set some time aside this weekend to try and see it. To go see it, yeah. But At the very least before the next episode of the podcast. But as far as new information, we got nothing. We got pretty much all the old trailers just smashed into one. It still looks cool, but other than yep. that. Yep. Um, they, one thing that we were excited for, and they kind of glossed over in the stream, and looking into it after the stream, we realized why. PlayDnd.com. They launched. Uh, it is a new way to get into um, Magic the Gap. Or sorry, I'm not Magic. The get into D&D if you've never played. It's a great way. They they claim it's a great way to quickly create a character, come up with a name, a class, make your character sheet ready, uh, and then they boast the free adventures that are available on D&D Beyond: The Lost Minds of Fandelver, The Frozen Sick Adventure from the uh, Wild Mount book, as well as Prisoner 13, uh, a notorious prison featured in D&D Honor Among Thieves, and you have to get a, a key and all that kind of stuff. When you go to the website, it's just a it's just a slick. It's just a slick, user-friendly interface to create a D and D Beyond character sheet. Yep, that's all it is. They that's, took D and D Beyond and made D and D Beyond. Yeah, they took D and D Beyond and they made it a choose your own adventure book <laughs> on a web page, basically. So, a little bit upsetting, but again, you can. This is a, this is always a good reminder that the Lost Minds of Fendelver is free on D and D Beyond, as well as the Frozen Sick and Prisoner Thirteen. There's a lot of free adventures available on D and D Beyond. Highly recommend. They used to do the Adventure of the Week or Encounter of the Week. Yes, that was awesome. They did that for a while, and you can check all of those out. Just search up D and D Beyond Encounter of the Week, and it's from several years ago. At one point, I copied and pasted a lot of them into some documents to search through at some point, but. Yeah, There's some it, good stuff in there. You know, it's 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 a great thing that uh, uh, Wizards of the Coast has provided people with a lot of free stuff to play their game that they want you to play pay for. Yeah. And while most people will end up paying for it, if you don't want to pay for D&D, there's a mm -hmm. way to play D&D without paying for D&D. Provided by D&D. And provided by D&D. And as emphasized in... One of the other highlights of the of the stream, possibly my favorite highlight of the stream, uh, Joe Cat, a wonderful, wonderful creator on YouTube, does a lot of illustration and songs and comedy. He has a bunch of a crap guide to D and D videos for all the classes and DMing, mm -hmm. and it's very, very entertaining. Highly recommend. He did a he did an animated song sponsored for them, being like, "Hey, it's so easy to run D and D. You should do it." Neat. Didn't need to be here. No. I mean, if they wanted to open with that, like, I totally would have been fine with, like, oh, this is our intro to it all. Uh, but then, they, yeah, they kind of gave it its own segment where, again, love Joe Cat, love the video itself. Kind of weird. Not really worthy of the D&D Direct. Yeah. It, it's cool for him. I'm glad, like, I'm glad they paid him money to make a cool animated thing. And it's a really good, it's really good animation. Mm -hmm. Joe Cat's awesome. Oh, yeah. Has a, has a live play on that live play show. 
friend friend of ours, friend of the show, friend of mine personally, Norb Feldeleb is uh, one of the players in that live play show. You should check it out on Joe Cat's YouTube channel. But again, not really necessary for this D&D Direct. Uh, they briefly touched upon D&D play events at local game shops from April 7th to 9th. Game stores in the United States and Canada will be running Voyage to Stormwreck Isle, which is an introductory like 30-minute demo adventure uh, that has ready-to-play uh, characters so that you can just sit down and play. Experienced players also have the opportunity to do a fourth-level heist adventure, Prisoner 13, as previously mentioned. It's free on D&D Beyond, but it is also included in Keys to the Golden Vault. Uh, you can talk to your local game stores. They glossed over that, so we will as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, they we've talked about actually, I believe, last podcast, Yeah, but we also glossed over there. They're just trying to get more people to play D&D, which it, is fine. Totally Absolutely fine great. with it. Totally fine with it. Um, next, Hasbro's a toy company. <laughs> you know what? Right down to their core, that's what they actually... I believe began as yeah, unless it became as a tire company. But uh, probably, who knows? But um, you can buy a bunch of you can buy a bunch of action figures that are overpriced that feature characters from uh, the uh, the Honor Among Thieves movie. You get some large figures of Xanathar, is Goldfish, an Albear, Displacer Beast. You can get. Um, you can get action figures of all all the characters from the 1980s D and D cartoon, Dicelings. I mean, it's whatever. They're overpriced. <laughs> if you're a collector and into that sort of thing, like great. Yeah, unfortunately, they, I feel they're trying to sell col- they're trying to sell children's toys as collectors' items. Yeah, uh, they look like children's toys. Yeah, absolutely. and if they were priced as children's toys, I'd be more up for it. But no, they're priced like collectors' items, and most of them look bad because they yeah. are children's toys yeah like if you're a kid and you like the D movie and you wanted to get chris P- chris pine and fucking hugh grant and as action figures and play with them and they're like 10 bucks a piece fine that's cool that'd be fine but they're they're cornering these as quote unquote the golden archive collection which are premium six inch figures of character and it's it's and same with the 1980s uh cartoon <laughs> Cartoon, the 1980s D and D cartoon um, figures they have. Again, there those those ones look good. Those ones are cool. Yeah, they're still priced like a collector's item. Yeah, it's not worth the time. Another collector's item for the D and D movie tie-in, one that I'm more interested in if the price is right. That is an official Secret Lairs drop, Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves six cards that are available you can get them for fifty dollars in a foil version or forty dollars in non-foil that feature uh the six main characters of the D honor among thieves movie including chris pine himself and hugh grant and all of the other yeah the so other. these this secret layer includes art of each actor as their character on a magic card um, but and they all have unique designs as well. The card designs are very interesting. Yeah, these aren't just uh, a lot of the time wizards will do um, just uh, facades. They'll just re- uh, uh, reprint a card with but a give it a new art, art on it. Yeah, and exactly. Name. But these actually have unique mechanics, and some of them are really, really cool. Yeah, like uh, the druid Doric Nature's Warden, and then Doric Albear Avenger. It's a double sided card. Uh, the backside, the Albear gives a 2-2 Anthem and Trample to legendary creatures would go absolutely wonderfully in my Jota the Unifier deck, giving an additional Anthem and Trample to all of my legendary creatures, which would be highly, highly sought after. The, uh, the, uh, there's one, the white one, whatever. Ooh, yeah. Uh, Zenk, Paladin, Unbroken, Double Strike, and Auras You Control have Exalted. I still don't fully understand Exalted. Uh, is it just an additional plus one plus one on that like creatures that aura is attached to? Whenever uh, it, it has the reminder text there. Oh, for each instance. Of, oh, so the more auras you get out, the more plus one plus one you get when it is attacking by itself. So and that, that'd be great in my Ivy deck. Unfortunately, Ivy is Simic and not white. I feel like I feel like that Paladin. You could build a mono white auras or throw them in the tram. Um, yeah, cause yeah, oh, he'd be great in in SRAM or uh or an enchantment base or like a, an enchantress deck, like th- uh, Sithis, the Harvest Hand. Yeah, as like a Voltron option to 
attack your auras on to because he comes packed with double strike and there's a two four and the moment you start putting auras on him they all have exalted so every and you could just have him attack by himself if you have a way to get him trample just or something do a, yeah just do a ton of smacky smack damage yep uh the wild magic sorcerer you want to be rolling dice to get effects when you cast instance and sorceries uh, Hugh Grant's character, Forge, Neverwinter, Charlatan, Menace, Ward, Sacrifice a Creature, Wants Treasures, Treasure Matters again, uh, Holga, Relentless Rager, Wants to Attack Every Turn, we already talked about the Druid, and then Chris Pine, Fortell. Yeah, he Each, has a, Every non-land card has Fortell. So that's something. And you goad creatures when you cast a, your second spell. Interesting designs. I don't know if it's worth $40. I might pick up a card or two as a single if the price is right. Price is right. Once TCG player gets a hold of them after they release. Yes. Uh, next, we get a very long segment dedicated to R.A. Salvatore talking about the history of Dridst, as it's been 35 years. And uh, the third book in the Way of the Drow series, Lolth's Warrior, is releasing this August. He also collaborated with his son, Gino Salvatore, uh, and the team behind the video game, the free-to-play MMORPG based on D&D, Neverwinter, for the next release of Neverwinter, Menzo Baranzen. I am proud of myself for getting that name in the first try. Good job. <laughs> I, I've, I've stumbled over that name many times. Uh, it is currently out, and the module takes players to the infamous Underdark City for the very first time. You can log into Neverwinter between now and April 4th to receive a digital D&D gift as well. This part of the stream was just a... I get it. Dritz has been very influential to the D&D uh, storyline throughout the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as R.A. Bob Salvador was talking, you know, people have reached out to him and said, thank you for your, your contributions to the, you know, to the lore and to the community. Um, but then the whole the whole thing that was actually important was one the book release and two the uh, the collaboration for the uh, for Neverwinter uh, both kind of glossed over yeah both like hey there's a book coming out hey more for Neverwinter yeah let's talk let's talk to R. A. Salvatore and just let him speak for what felt like ten minutes yeah <laughs> about nothing really pertinent to anything in the stream should um, that that could have been just I you know if that was just a standalone thing probably got more oh, yeah. attention oh absolutely it would have. Uh, Next, what I thought was probably my favorite part, but also was just soured by how it's going down. Uh, the D&D virtual tabletop. It looks fucking gorgeous. Uh, they sat down with the game director, Kale Stutzman. Uh, they went into a deep look at the virtual tabletop. Uh, it's going to be a 3D play space for D&D adventures, integrations with the D&D rule set, 3D models for creatures, the ability to create your own adventures, uh, and it has a lot of amazing features. They kind of sat around a table land party style, which was a little bit cringe. It was a little, yeah. It was a little cringe, but the game itself looks absolutely stunning. Uh, at the last year's D&D Direct, when they mentioned that when they were going to be releasing adventure books and other D&D books, they would have codes in them that would unlock 3D assets and pre-made maps and stuff that tie in with the adventures in the books uh, for the t uh, 3D tabletop uh, client. That being said, deep, deep missed opportunity here for uh, this virtual tabletop by having it just be downloadable from D&D Beyond instead of put on Steam and PlayStation predominantly for the VR compatibility. Yeah. A 3D... We've talked about this previously. A 3D virtual tabletop of this quality. It clearly, there's going to be quality. You can tell by looking at it. It's going mm -hmm. to be very, very well made with integrations through D&D Beyond released on Steam with a VR compatible mode where you can treat it like you can sit at a table by yourself, play virtual D&D, &D, and then have a VR headset on and just line the plane up of the table that you're sat at with the map in front of you and you can use your controller to pick up minis and move them and make it a lot more manual. That seems like a no-brainer to me. Yeah, and it's not like they're building their own system. They're using a game engine. They're using Unreal Engine 5. And they have full develop full-time developers obviously working on this. This is a whole project. Um and they and, and they're missing a mark. They're they, 
and they just want to keep it for themselves. <laughs> yeah, like, that's the thing. It's like they talk about, oh, we want to monetize D&D more. Okay, well, the way you're trying to do it, you're like doing the opposite of what the people want. You know, if you put it on Steam, you if you put it on a sales platform, yeah. people would buy this. But now you're Absolutely. just... Instead of just trying to tax your your creators... It's... We, we've... They just want to shoot themselves in the foot. Like they don't, I genuinely don't think anyone there that's at the higher level at Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast understands what potential the products that they already are planning on releasing have and how much they are kneecapping themselves. It's, un, it's unbelievable. Like this virtual tabletop should be a slam dunk industry standard. If you're doing virtual D and D you're using this one because it's clearly the best one option, but mm-hmm. it's not. Yeah. It's going to be the prettiest. Oh yeah. And it it's integrated great. with, integrated with D and D beyond. It might be the easiest to build sets in, but it's going to be missing a few key features and a few key distribution channels that just now I understand maybe they're starting. It's still weird that a lot of game companies will do this where they start somewhere mm-hmm. and then, okay, we got it out. Now we can start pushing different things that we want to do, you know, our day two uh, implementations. Yeah. But that being said, um, generally those are on a, a, a platform where you can release set updates easily, like steam, PlayStation, mm-hmm. Xbox game pass. Like, exactly. And not to mention the amount of funding they could get by try by being like, "Hey, I th- I'm pretty sure they're releasing this for free on D and D Beyond, which this is a game you could charge sixty dollars for, and I don't think anyone would bat an eye, or or make it free to play and charge for expansions or whatever, mm-hmm. or make it a cheap game and then offer it as part of like game pass or PlayStation plus or any of these other subscription Subscription. services in video games. And then they pay you on the fucking back end for that. Like Xbox is paying for every game that goes to game pass. PlayStation is playing, paying for every monthly release on PlayStation plus. Like I know Well, we did. I remember last year when they first announced this, there was a lot of contention about kind of that point where, Oh, they're, you know, especially microtransactions were the concern. Yeah. But that being said, this is just a 100% add-on. This is a luxury add-on to D&D. You can yeah. play D&D just fine without it. Like, if it was a game... If it was, this is the game you have to have in order to play D&D, that'd yeah. be one thing. But it's not. It is a it is a, a special thing. You don't even need it to use D&D Beyond. No. You, can, it, you don't need to pay for D&D Beyond, even. It's... <laughs> Again, they have so many good ideas, and then it's like, and then it's like, ah, we'll just we'll just shit out this game. We'll put it up. We'll put it as a download on D and D Beyond, and we'll have codes for it, and we'll make adventures for it, whatever. When it could be like one of their core products, yeah, and be worthy of paying for and worthy of getting expansions for. Like, imagine like you get the. Let's say they did an Icewind Dale adventure for one D and D, and you buy the Icewind Dale book. You get the digital code for it on D and D Beyond, so you have it digitally. You get the code for it, so you get all of the battle maps in it, uh, including all the assets that they used in the three D virtual tabletop. You can then pay another fifteen dollars for the Icewind Dale three D assets pack, which does have some overlap like you get like when you buy the adventure book you get the assets from the adventure book included in it or you can get all of this massive wealth of other 3d assets available to you minis terrain Mm -hmm. does any sort of things for 15 bucks that's not what they seem like this doesn't seem like what they're going to do which part of it's like oh yeah it's going to be free but now it's just less useful yeah. Than it would have been. And as a company that is outwardly been saying they want to make more money, this is a good way of doing that. Yeah. And they're just giving up on it for fuck knows why. <sighs> Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> more more toy collectibles. If you go to dndmini.com, you can get new life-size D&D figures. Everyone remembers their first Mimic encounter, and this one you won't forget. The tricky Mimic figure stands 20 inches tall, 15 inches wide, and 16 inches deep. Nice. That's a lot. It's a lot. Hey, where do you have uh, do you have, do you have space for that in our house? <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> also, the baby owlbear. 
You can get that. It's 11 inches tall, 12 inches wide. Perfect for displaying on a bookshelf. Though, you may want to be a lookout for Mama Owlbear looking for her cub. Again, this is a toy company. They're yeah. making... They're making... Uh, they're more display pieces. These are more appropriate as collector's items. Yeah. Uh, the Owlbear right now is... They're both in pre-order. Right now, the Owlbear baby will run you $129.99. Jesus Christ. And the Mimic is three seventy-five. dollars um, Basically... Let's be honest. These aren't new. These are just new being officially made. Like there, we walked around Gen Con last year and saw plenty of life size kobolds. Yeah, you can get so many cool things. Yeah, you can get full size things. There, I bet there's tutorials online on how to make full size yeah. things like that. And that costs you way less than three hundred and seventy five dollars. And not even getting into the, you can three D print them at that scale if you have a big enough print bed. Yeah, or you can chop them up in in uh, in, in and different. It print them in smaller chunks and glue them together and Ooh, paint no, it yourself. Do. No, we have a bunch of weird, like cool, like chests and things. We do. We should just get one and make it a mimic. Put some teeth on it. Make it a give it a tongue. Make it a mimic. And sell it for three hundred seventy five dollars. Now someone would buy it. Someone would buy it. And that's here's fair. the thing: they wouldn't be giving Hasbro money. Nah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So again, spend your money. Be smart, but. Come on. They're cool looking, but are, and so it's going to come down to, are they worth it to you? Yeah. Another cool thing. It's, it's a, it's a roller coaster of a direct really. Oh, really? Roller, roller coaster of emotions for every good one. There's a bad one. And for everyone like, Oh, that's pretty neat. It's like, Oh, okay. But it's not as neat as it could have been. But, uh, Joe Meganello's 50th anniversary D and D documentary is still in production. And he talked about how it was still in production and wants to come out in 2024. Yeah. As we are already aware of. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Can't wait. I mean, we like we like Joe. I'm sure it's probably going to be one of the better ones because there's several. Yeah, there are several uh, D&D documentaries coming out in uh, the coming year, year and a half, two years. And we love Joe Jan- Joe Manganiello. Yeah. Joe Jan- Joe Joe Mangy. Um, but uh, Joe Mangy. Un- unfortunately, again, same with the D&D um, Beyond or the D&D movie and same with... Um, really most things that they've said they didn't tell us anything new play dnd.com the dnd movie joe manganella's um uh documentary it's, these are not new we've talked about these on these podcast on this podcast before multiple times multiple times and they're all cool don't get me wrong these are things that you know we're excited about or we're excited about when they're first announced but now you're just like i don't know it's like you fed us dessert and now you're like here's another pork chop all right like, here's, cool. here's the exact same pork chop we fed you 20 minutes ago. Like, the the part that everyone was looking forward to, the look at the future of D&D sh- source books and adventures. They reiterate what is coming in 2023, what we mentioned at the top of the podcast. Big Bear presents Glory of the Giants in Spring, Fandelver, and below the Shattered Obelisks. So they've had the, like all the obelisks that have been showing up in various D&D adventures yeah. for a while now. And now it's all culminating in a book, which is pretty cool. That'll be coming out in the summer. Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse coming out in the fall. The Book of Many Things also in the summer. Um, we knew about all of those. And then they talk about the future things that have not been announced. No book names. Nope. What What's the first adventure for one D and don't know. Nope. Is when's one D and like are we aiming for spring twenty twenty four, fall twenty twenty four? No, didn't say any of that. <sighs> they announced that Vecna will unleash his cosmic horror upon the D and D multiverse in a world hopping adventure in twenty twenty four that celebrates D and D's fiftieth fifty year history and reveals plots for years to come. Cool. 1D and D or 5E. Yeah. It's an important distinction. I'm sure it'll be fairly well done. I mean, I feel like the D&D adventure books have been kind of bland, generally of speaking. have. I mean... Strahd it, was cool. It, it's a different, you know, it's a different type of... They're, they're different type of people who some people want to run uh, these adventures and really dive into, like, yeah, the lore. Especially it's, uh, uh, Curse of Strahd is a big one that a lot of people like. But then there's a lot more people like us who I feel are just like, all right, I want to do my own thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these. Hopefully, my my true hope for what they do with this for this 50 year anniversary of D and D is that they 
give us a good product, but then don't try to twist our arms off and take our legs in the process. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, as Hasbro has been dropping the ball a lot, they dropped the ball for Magic 30 in 2022. Um, hopefully they have learned from that, and in 2024 with the history of, or with sorry, with uh, the D&D's 50-year anniversary we get something worth its salt yeah absolutely that's that's the hope um and vecna and this vecna adventure could be awesome i would love it but they did announce some other villains for various uh future releases no no plane mentioned no story no nothing but uh the red wizards of thay which are featured in the D movie will appear in an adventure in 2025 so that's presumably so two years one, out. So that's presumably one D and D, as will the major antagonist of the 1983 D and D cartoon, Venger. Venger. So that'll presumably also be one D and D, and I guess we're going to the D and D cartoon now as a source book of some kind. So that's something, or at least will appear in the Forgotten Realms or something. And then they said to expect the reappearance of the League of Malevolent. Ugh, fucking words, man. The League of Malevolence. The League of Malevolence, a group of villains. First featured in the 2021 Feywild adventure book, Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Cool. So that'll be expanded, more multiverse shit. Cool. What is going to be the first adventure for 1D&D? Are we getting a Forgotten Realms? Are we getting... like, Yeah. Where are we going? What, what are we doing? F- what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> and it was all just kind of like, ah, here's some vague ideas that we have for the future. Okay, see you. Bye. Like All that, right. That, you know, if you wanted to go into detail a bit about more of these, you know, and more of the uh, coming in 2023, if you had wanted to take, you know, 15 minutes and do more in uh, all of those instead of showing me... Like what they did with the last D&D Direct. Yeah, absolutely. Where yeah. they talked about the keys, or what was it, the the Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel. Yeah. And they talked about that for 15 minutes. That was pretty freaking, or I was like five to 10 minutes. But still, that was cool. Yeah. What's Bigby's book? What about the what about the the book of many things? We got we got oh yeah they're coming they're coming they're gonna be cool but yeah they didn't say they didn't say anything yeah this was a this was a stream that in many ways felt to me like hey we we've, we've been doing these it's that time of year we need to do one uh buy our toys buy all these collectors items that Hasbro wants. And also, yeah, we're doing D&D stuff. Don't worry. Yeah, as much as uh, we appreciate them giving us content to shit on them about. Which it's, it seems like it's happening constantly. We'd much rather talk about fun things in D&D. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, at this point, I'm going to... Before we get in, they had a post-stream celebration announcement thing where they talked about more stuff, I guess. Uh, but discord moderator dk alexander commented on the D direct saying nerd culture tiktok nerd culture tiktok if you want to find them there uh quote i read on it but it seems i don't know meh it's cool but there seems to be too many quote buy to have objects and kind of pointless then the actual 5e content is all right looks cool but too many adventures i liked books like van richten's guide to ravenloft and was hoping that that was the kind of content they were going to go with i just can't play all these adventures yeah, we've talked about this in the past where they they have n- very little structure when it comes to what they release. Oh, yeah. Especially, like, well, let's look at 2022. They released, you know, uh, they released Spelljammer, and they released, well, in, in early 23, they released Dragonlance, plus they were, all of them, Radiant Citadels, all of them were adventure-based. Sure, yeah. they have started, like, oh, we'll put out a copendium each year, you know, a collection of adventures. Those are the those are the best adventure books they release, Those by are the, the best? Yeah, absolutely. But then it's like, well, every year, if you want to do four releases, first off, maybe don't. Um, <laughs> maybe give us time to digest each thing like quarter quarterly releases i see i like it makes sense from a business point of view because they have quarterly projections mm-hmm. and earnings that they need to report to investors blah 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 four books a year should be the top end of the release schedule oh yeah but then <laughs> then then actually curate those like give us yeah. a source book and give us an adventure and give us a copendium and then give us something else worthwhile of our time not just here's five adventures yeah, or here's 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 seven years of gameplay for you. Basically, in one year. yeah. Here's, I've I've thought about this previously, and 
to me, the adventure anthologies, I think, are the some of the best products they release. Second only to just here's here's the Sword Coast, here's Ravenloft, here's Wildmount. Your campaign settings. here the settings. In my mind, spring core rulebook. Xanathar's, Tasha's, a monster mate, something like that. Then, late spring, early summer, campaign setting. Late summer, early fall, adventure, end of the year anthology. That just seems like that you get the one big adventure. Mm -hmm. So you have an entire year to run your adventure, preferably an adventure that ties into the campaign setting book. The setting book just gives you resources and tools to create your own stories and one that can pair well with the upcoming adventure book if that's what you want to do so that way you can read about a world get used to the lore for several months learn as much about it as you can and then when you have an adventure in front of you that ties into that world you already have that base of knowledge making it easier to get up and running and make a really rich story to tell and then your adventure anthologies are just like super useful as a dm yeah it's like here's a here's one level adventure, you level need, one, a level seven, a level twelve, a level nineteen, yeah, whatever. You want, you want a round one shot? You want to throw it in as a tie break from your campaign? You want to start here and go bigger? Exactly. Go for it. But exactly. It, that just makes too much sense, though. Any other thoughts on the stream itself before we get into the post script, the post stream? Just gonna reiterate, could have been an email. Yeah, I could have been a blog post. As an article with all the links out in the videos. Perfectly, perfectly reasonable. That would have been fine. Ten as minute a, read as a D and D direct. It's a, is it? Does it say ten minute read at the top? I don't know. I just said. Oh, that'd be so funny if it said ten minute read and it was a twenty five minute live stream. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. But we have the post stream celebration that they basically immediately went into, featuring some more people that we don't know. Um, coming soon, very soon, March thirty first. You can snag a selection of digital D&D books as well as digital dice for up to 40% off on D&D Beyond from March 31st to April 9th. The image that they are using to promote it shows the Player's Handbook, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. They're trying to get all the five, trying to get as many of those 5e sales as they can in before they have to release all the one D&D stuff. Uh, they also have a Steam sale starting today as of recording, if you are watching it on if you are listening to this podcast when it releases on Wednesday, which is tomorrow, you have until Monday, April third, to get up to seventy five percent off D and D video games on Steam. Uh, a lot of which they decided to remove from Steam. Not not two months ago, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there's more goodies that you can claim from the D and D Honor Among Thieves movie, including the Thieves Gallery on D and D Beyond. If you haven't claimed those already, those are already released. Uh, which is basically just stat blocks for many of the characters in the D&D Honor Among Thieves movie. You can also get uh, Thembershod Digital's dice set coming soon if you use D&D Beyond's digital dice, uh, as well as powerful magic items featured in D&D Honor Among Thieves that you can bring into your game. Uh, they also are going to have the Gemstone Dice Pack available with these really cool Gemstone dice on D&D Beyond. Um... That's that. That's that. Cool. Uh, I don't have much more to say. I like, okay, discounts. Sale, sure. Great. Sales are great. Love, Love a for, sale. Other than that, that's kind of the that's kind of our our recap on uh, the D and D direct of this year. Kind of sucked. Kind of a waste of time, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, did not need to happen. It definitely felt like something they felt obligated to announce obligated to do because yes. they did it in the past uh kind of like how for years and years and years all the video game companies would feel the need to time their announcements around e3 and they still kind of do that even though e3 is basically dead it's basically dead yeah so ubisoft was supposed to be the big one the big the one this year and i heard they just pulled out i mean yeah i it, so Nintendo does their own thing now. N Nintendo was like Xbox the does first their own one. thing now. Nintendo was the first one to be like, well, we're not doing E3. We're just yeah. going to do a direct. Uh, and then Sony and Xbox pulled out 2020 with COVID was their reason to be like, we're not doing this anymore. And now they're not. Yeah. So great. I prefer it that way. Honestly, like speak when you have shit to say. You don't need to pick an arbitrary time of the year every year to announce all your shit like this. 
And what's great about the modern age is to you can you can well wizards is doing this a lot you can leak things yeah and they'll get blown up oh by, yeah by people like us absolutely more more uh, successful than us at this time but eventually someday that kind of, that's kind of what happened with the the honor among thieves secret lair that's true it got uh it got leaked in a facebook a singapore facebook ad yep a couple days ago and people went wild over it yeah and now it's officially announced and you can pre-order it uh also officially announced, the thing that I actually want to talk about, uh, two weeks ago, basically right before we posted last week's episode of the podcast, there's a first look at the Lord of the Rings, Tales of Middle-Earth, Magic the Gathering set. I'm very excited about yes, this set. Yes, all of your money will be gone. Yes, I I have illusions of grandeur, delusions of grandeur, and <laughs> illusions, just constantly, of collecting all of the cards in the set. We'll see how well that goes, but... You can preview a lot of the cards that are going to be released, including things like the One Ring, Frodo, Sauron's Bane, Samwise the Stoutheart, Gollum, Patient Plotter, the Mountain Doom, Legendary Land, uh, Gandalf the Grey is going to be a cool commander. Um, you cannot pass. You shall not pass. Bothers me, but you know, whatever. It, it was what they did in the nineteen uh, eighties cartoon I, I know. movie. I know. Uh, Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil. He's such a great name. Such it's a great name. D- wasn't featured in the movies. Very important part of, of the Fellowship of the Ring. Also, as a card, it's Wooberg. It's all five colors. It's a four four with all colors. That is Sagas matter. Yeah, Sagas tribal. <laughs> it wants lore counters, and it basically gives you Saga Cascade when a Saga completes. There are a lot of cool Sagas out there. It. Honestly, it's one of the coolest designs that we've seen from a card yet. Uh, also, the Frodo Sauron's Bane, you pour more mana into him and his stats change. He gets higher base power and toughness, gets lifelink. And then eventually, uh, there's a mechanic that we don't really know what it does yet. It's the ring tempting you. Uh, and if you level up, quote unquote, level up Frodo Sauron's Bane enough, uh, he gets an ability where whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, that tam- that player loses the game if the ring has tempted you four or more times this game. Otherwise, the ring tempts you. I wonder if that is going to be some weird mechanic, like kind of almost reverse poison counters. Yeah. Because a lot of these say, you know, a lot of these have do something, then the ring tempts you. Yeah. And like maybe you get so many and you have kind of that corrupted status of your own where it buffs you. But if you do it too many times, mm-hmm. then you die. I you get, lose I, the game. That could be cool. That would be interesting. Uh, the one ring itself is a legendary artifact. It's indestructible. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, when you cast it, you gain protection from everything until your next turn. Interesting. They specify you have to cast it so you can't blink it yep. to get protection from everything constantly. The beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life for every burden counter on the one ring. It has the ability to tap to put a burden counter on it and draw a card for each burden counter on it. So tap to draw cards, a lot of cards, but every time you do that, you lose life at the beginning of your upkeep more and more and more as the game goes on. So it's very much ties into the idea of the one ring, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's also, this has caused a lot of controversy. They've had the serialized collector booster cards for a while that yeah. are like one of however, like, many. however many they make of a certain alt art foil thing. But there is a, um, a Mordor script alternate art one ring foil that is only being released in that can only be found in a collector's booster pack i said singular there because it is one of one it is one of one there will only ever be one serialized mordor text one ring artifact card ever and the worst part about it it's either going to be some in some rich asshole's hands be in a pack that never gets opened or in a landfill chances are yeah which kind of sucks i would i would find it amazing so the, it's basically they're they're kind of doing the willy wonka and golden you know charlie you got the golden ticket anyway but i would i would find it hilarious do you remember last year when they just found a bunch of <laughs> dominaria booster boxes yeah just in a warehouse yeah like 30 years old if 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 a bunch of unsold lord of the rings ones got put into a warehouse and then yeah like at the 60th anniversary of magic the gathering somebody's like opens up a random like glove compartment and is like 
huh oh and it's like people have you know freak out and there's a whole here's the thing the number i'm i cannot wait for the set to come out simply for the number of fake pack openings of opening the one of one one ring oh yeah also if you open the one of one one ring immediately put that motherfucker in as many protective layers as possible first thing you do is contact wizards of the coast be like hey i found the fucking card let's do some shit with it contact mr beast logan paul like <laughs> all these motherfuckers do your rounds dude to get find find the professor hit up the professor of the Tolarian community like all of the people because they will absolutely want to do shit with you get that shit graded. just say get it graded get it, it gets to nine out of ten <laughs> it's like a, or pack fresh seven or something <laughs> <laughs> that would be so funny oh that would be great uh, uh they, other, oh, go ahead uh in in the collectors boosters as well is it just collectors boosters i think it's just i think it is just the collect yeah it's just the collectors boosters they're doing alternate art um elvish script soul rings uh in three different art styles to represent the three elven rings for the elves the six for the door or seven for the dwarves and the nine for men and they will also have serialized versions both non-foil and foil versions 3,000 non-foil for the elven one 7,000 for the dwarven one 9,000 for the human one then 300 700 900 for the foil versions of those respectively as well so some more cool serialized cards those are much more readily available you'll be more likely to find those yeah those probably still be expensive once yes. once they come to um and second market and they're just soul ring and they're just so, soul ring, so perfectly useful proxy it yeah <laughs> I think I think they're pretty cool. If I happen if I happen to pull one of those, so I don't plan on getting collectors boosters. You want uh, you want to get a gift bundle. So the gift bundle yeah. is uh, uh, so they have the bundle and the gift bundle. The gift bundle is going to be the bundle plus one collectors booster, basically. Yes. yes. And the collectors booster cost I think is around forty bucks a call co- uh, unnecessary. A pack. But if you buy the gift bundle, it's only ten dollars more than the regular bundle. So you're getting a thirty dollar discount mm-hmm. on the on that one collector booster pack yeah Yeah. unfortunately they're sold out everywhere pretty much um before we go any further let's go across we've talked about a lot of the cards let's go (laughs) these are all the products that are being released starter kit jumpstart boosters pre-release packs set boosters draft boosters collector boosters commander decks bundles and the gift bundle uh, important dates. It will first be shown uh, May 5th through 7th at MagicCon Minneapolis. Uh, it will also be debuted in pre- previews. will properly begin on May 30th. Card previews from May 30th until June 9th. June 8th, commander previews and deck lists for the commander precons. Complete card image gallery is going to be available on June 9th as well. In-store pre-release events will happen the weekend of June 16th to the 22nd. Magic the Gathering Arena's digital release is going to be June 20th. The global tabletop release will be June 23rd. Launch party events 23rd to the 25th the gift bundle will release on july 7th Uh, in-store celebration events will begin on july 7th until the 9th commander parties will be from july 21st to 23rd magic con barcelona will feature it on july 28th to the 30th store championships feature oh god store championships from <laughs> in august august 5th to the 13th and then holiday release because they're doing a wave two of the lord of the rings set November 3rd. They are going all in <laughs> on this partnership. They know what they've got here. Um, they are they're doing some cool box toppers and buy a box promo cards that are uh, reprints of staple cards with new art and different names. So the Great Henge has been reprinted as the party tree for this set. Uh, let's see, what is it? Ensnaring Bridge is the Bridge of Casa Doom. And then Wasteland is going to be the Valley of Gorgoth. Uh, there's a couple of different varieties of that. Also, uh, the Trailblazers boots are being reprinted as Lorian Brooch as one of the buy box promos, which is pretty cool. It has non-basic land walk. Mm-hmm. Don't know what that does. Uh, so if your compon- opponent controls a non-basic land, the, you, that is. creature cannot be blocked. That's the creature that this item is equipped to. That's awesome. It's a two mana artifact equipment that has equipped to, so it's actually pretty cheap to get and out and attach to something. Which is pretty since sweet. most people run a lot of non basic lands, yeah. you're good. Oh yeah. Now the one thing that I have already pre ordered, as have I, 
is the starter kit. Cards. Yes. Yay. Yes. 20 cool. bucks. One of the best values. You get two decks that are ready to play featuring a lot of Lord of the Rings cards. There are two 60-card decks uh, that are going to be built around... Oh, they are modern legal, legal by the way. All of these cards are modern legal. Yes. This is the first... Uh, this is not... Yeah. yeah. First season beyond that is modern legal. Which is ludicrous. Luda. Uh, but the two decks are going to be built around... Uh, one of them is a Selesnia green-white deck featuring Aragorn and Arwen Wed, a legendary creature with vigilance. They care about plus one, plus one counters. You gain life. Um... You gain life as well for every other creature you control when they attack, uh, enter the battlefield or attack. And then Sauron, the Lidless Eye, is Rakdos, Black Red, a 4-4 that when it enters the battlefield, you gain control of a target creature until the end of turn. You untap it, it gets haste, and then you can pay one Black Red to give creatures you control plus two plus O, oh, and then each opponent would lose two life. Interesting card designs. Uh, people are all upset because Aragorn's black. So what? That's what I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. um, does not matter. You can get the bundle, uh, which is going to include, uh, what is it, 40 basic lands, 20 traditional foil, and 20 non-foil, oversized spin-down counter. Uh, it is also going to include borderless scene cards. Uh, you can get versions of Frodo, Sauron's Bane, Samwise the Stout-Hearted, the One Ring, and Gollum Patient Plotter that are borderless cards with alternate art that you can line them up and then they have a scene. Uh, pr this particular scene being the end of the Lord of the Rings when uh, Gollum bites off Frodo's finger and the ring goes into lava, which is really cool. I like the scene borderless cards. Yeah, I believe they're going to have match. seven seven scenes in total, I believe. Yes, which is a lot. Uh, the four variant scene cards included in the bundle and gift bundle only. Um, they, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it's only the one. It's only the one. They have the bigger. They have the bigger one that we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, you can get the scene uh, in a two by two grid, but there are, okay, there are other scenes that exist in grids all the way up to six by three for very very epic scenes uh several more scenes in the set you can assemble with cards found in draft set and collector boosters uh the they're going to have pre-release kits which we will be buying quite a few of i believe uh commander decks there is a uh new printing of soul ring with some new art uh it seems like okay so we know what the four archetypes are going to be uh we have riders of rohan which is white red blue we have Frodo and the Fellowship, which is green, black, white. And we have Simic, which is the Elven Council. And red, black, blue is going to be the Hordes of Mordor. We also get a look at Sam, the Loyal Attendant, which is a partner with Frodo Adventurer's Hobbit as commanders, uh, seemingly, for... That would be, yeah, that would make sense as the, uh, Fellow, the, the food, fellowship. The food and fellowship. Uh, and then Radagast, Wizard of Wilds, seems like he'll end up in the Elven Council deck. Would be my guest. I a bead and burst, a bead beast and, beast beast and, and bird, beast and birds tribal. So that's that's pretty cool. And big spells. And big spells. That's something. I love some big spells. A lot of interesting things. Of course, the collector boosters. Uh, they have full art lands. Uh, each land, basic land type, has two different uh, variants where. It is just a chunk of the map of Middle Earth. Yep. So there's don't try to assemble a full map. It won't work. They've already told us. Sadly, unfortunately, Sadly. they've just included some parts that uh, fit the bill. Yep. They are available in draft set, jumpstart, and collector boosters. And in collector boosters, they will be foil as well. You also get ring framed variants of cards uh, that are just a different border that has the one ring script. Uh, circling a variant art for the cards. They show off cards that they've already shown. Frodo, Sauron's Bane, Samwise the Stout-Hearted, Gollum, Grandolf the Greg, Tom Bombadil. Um, 30 legendary cards in epic moments of the story specifically for them. Also available draft set and collector boosters. Got some borderless lands in Mountain Doom and the Shire. These are going to be legendary lands. Um, I... I don't know how much play uh, Mountain Doom. I think is going to get a lot of a lot of pay. Tap, pay one life to add black or red. You can pay one black red and tap it to deal one damage to each opponent, or five black red and tap it to sacrifice it. And a legendary artifact, and you can choose up to two creatures, then destroy the rest. Activate as a sorcery. Very thematic. Very thematic. You blow up Mountain Doom by destroying a legendary artifact, and then you get to keep two creatures. 
I wonder where they got that idea from. No idea. The Shire also is a mono green legendary land. It enters untapped if you control, or it enters tapped unless you control a legendary creature. You can also pay one in a green to tap it and tap an untapped creature you control and you create a food token. Yep. Seems like a, a very expensive cost to get food, even though it is thematic and cool. It is thematic, but you put it in the right deck. Yeah, but otherwise it probably won't see too much. The Mount Doom, on the other Mount hand. Mount Doom will see a lot of play, I suspect. Um, they show some extended arts, more extended arts. Uh, they show off more of uh, the various scene, borderless scene cards. They don't show the specific cards, but they show the art on this uh, six by three grid of a scene that looks like it is uh, the Siege of Minas Tirith. Uh, yeah, yeah, you got the Mumma Kill there. Yeah, the beautiful scene. Can't wait to see what all these cards are. But there's plenty. There's the, the dragon. There's some elephants. There's warriors. There's oh, you yeah. know, all sorts of things in this. So it's going to be interesting to see when it all comes together. Yeah. And then in November, there will be four additional scenes, each of which will be three by two cards that will arrive uh, later in November. Okay, we're almost, we're almost at the end. Jumpstart packs. There's going to be, let's see, five unique themes, and then they're going to release more uh, later. Uh, there are also five rare jumpstart cards that can also be found in collector boosters. So a little bit of cross th- cross pollination there. Uh, you got the set booster box. You got the draft booster box. You got the gift bundle, which is arriving later on January on July seventh. Everything with the regular bundle, except it has a different themed storage bar uh, box, different artwork, variant color, over uh, all. It also includes the main thing. It, it includes a collector booster. Yeah. That's the big thing. That's the that's the main difference. Uh, holiday release, as we discussed in November, uh, there's a going to be a special edition collector's booster, which includes new treatments and special editions for all the cards. Oh my God! A uh, volume two of the Jumpstart, adding more themes to mix in, and as well as well new scenes in the very. Oh my God! There's so many products. <sighs> there's gonna be a secret layer. <laughs> Of course, there's going to be a secret layer. Always going to be a secret layer. And it'll be the first to arrive on arenas as well on June 20th. Wow. That is a lot of product. That is a lot of product. Um, It's going to be a lot of money. A lot of your money is going to go into this. Uh, I don't like how you're directing that at me. I was very pointedly at you. I know. Well... I feel like my original intent of trying to collect one of every card, uh, probably a bit unfeasible, particularly with the one of one. Yeah, so, yeah, you might have a trouble so, getting that one of one ring. I'll get, I'll get a one ring. Sure, I, I fucking certainly hope I do. At it the very seems least. like it'll be a yeah. It's only rare. It's only rare. But uh, yeah, we're gonna. I'm going to be very poor this summer. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Gen Con and I'm going to be eating like peanut butter and jelly and sleeping in, and sleeping in a car. Perfect. (laughs) And not, and just not buying anything because I can't afford it. Uh, All right. It's, that's, that's all of the news. There's one more wrap up item, just a announcement from yesterday uh, around the uh, Lord of the Rings, Middle of Tales of Middle Earth and Wiles of Eldraine. Um, Wizards has said that, uh, the tabletop um, releases will continue to uh, happen prior to the um, arenas drops. Yeah, they they announced um, that at the end of last year uh, they, for the sets that were happening then because people were complaining that arenas was getting stuff at the same time. Yep, but they said for Middle Earth and the Wilds of Eldraine that will continue. Yes, um, Japanese uh, Japanese Magic Gathering fans may experience a different. Um, release schedule. Release schedule. But good other than that, good for them. Check out your local game store for more details. We have we have a there's a wonderful thing at our local game store with the with the punch card. For every five dollars we spend, they punch a hole in this card. We're almost completely full on this thing. By the time we get the March of the Machines pre-release kits, it'll be fully filled out. Yeah, and probably some of another card, which hopefully they. Give us another card. I can't imagine they wouldn't. But when you you can redeem that card for fifty dollars, and I can tell you right now, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to be making the executive decision to spend all of the the fifty card the fifty dollars that we're getting from those uh, on Lord of the Rings. As long sets. as they're for both of us and not you. 
The set booster. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine. We'll get we'll get this we'll use it on the set booster box. Works for or, or on the pre release kits or something. I don't know. Actually, no, we're not gonna use it on the pre release kits because the set booster box certain products at this at this local game store you can't buy. Uh, like you can't buy a two hundred dollar set booster box and then they'll give you two hundred dollars worth of that. No, you have need to buy lower more products at a lower price point. They don't yes. want you to buy one big thing. So we'll redeem it for one big thing and then we'll pay for the pre-release kits and stuff fabulous with all that being said samuel do you have anything else anything in the tiktok live chat oh my gosh we do we do we haven't we haven't vamped at all we haven't done any of the normal things you can check out all the links in the link tree in the bio this podcast goes live on youtube and podcast services around the globe we got an amazon storefront with all the cool magic the gathering and D stuff that we use uh you can join our discord server uh where like 250 to 300 people currently enjoy we have People that subscribe to us on our TikTok lives where we play Match of the Gathering once a week every Monday. Yeah, we got homebrew, though we haven't been doing that this year because the OGL thing made us sad. Uh, you can still get our old homebrew there. A lot of it's free. Yeah. And I think that... Oh, the Instagram, the YouTube, all of that nonsense. Yes, carry on. All right. So quite, we uh, now we come to the part of the podcast where we take questions and answer, and answer them from either our Discord or the TikTok live chat. And here we go, diving in. Goyle asks do werewolves take fall damage even though they're immune to non-magical bludgeoning damage oh depends on if the world is magical oh that, um, that gets into like a philosophical debate about the weave true but also if you are a fan of the dimension 20 mm-hmm. uh they at one point have a werewolf being attacked by a dragon the dragon cannot do any damage to him while trying to eat him because he does not take because his the dragon's teeth are non-magical and he does not take piercing damage of non-magical types. I like to imagine it's uh, I would imagine no, but I think it'd be cool if you flavored it as okay, they jump, they splat and like everything in them breaks and crunches and then like a round later they like <laughs> themselves back <laughs> together and then they're up and fighting again. That'd be cool. Yeah. For all for your friendly NPC werewolves, that's absolutely how it should work. For the enemies, let them, uh, you know, maybe maybe they could beat to death. Who knows? Or at least like, or at least like, remove an action or something. Yeah. Like change change the dynamic of how we we we're, we're big proponents of like cool things like removing legendary actions or or when an enemy gets at low HP, they get like a bonus action where they can dash and disengage. Like yeah. changing the dynamic of a fight based on Which, what's happening. Yeah. Let your players affect the game. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah Collins asks, is soup a cereal? Sorry, is cereal a soup? I believe we've answered this one. We have, we have, it's been a while since we've had a food talk. We have, on the show. it has been. Um. Jeremiah, good question. Um. Uh, is cereal a soup? No, because soup requires being heated and cooked within a liquid. Oatmeal, by that definition, is a soup. A soup. Uh, a very thick soup, more like a stew, but the cereal, since the cereal itself is not being cooked in hot liquid milk, it is not. No. A soup. Good question. That was, um, was very good. It's been, it's been user, a while. User 827-80903 asks, what would you say is the best few cards to add to an elf token deck? Depends on the colors. I mean, obviously you've got the... Like your mana dork elves, your Llanowar elves, your uh, Findhorn elves, that kind of stuff. Um, a Leosaur Shepherd is a really good one because it has an ability where you can turn all of your elves into 5-5 five, five dinosaurs yep. uh, at, for, with uh, Trample, I believe, until end of turn. That's interesting. Uh, there's also a, uh, if you have access to black in whatever deck you are doing, uh, two black green, it is Lathril, Blade of the Elves. It's a 2-3 with Menace that when it deals combat damage to a player, you create that many 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature tokens. You can also tap it and tap un- 10 untapped elves you control to cause each opponent to lose 10 life and you gain 10 life. That is going to be my next commander for a commander deck. Fair warning. Uh, also, the new Tyvar Jubilant Brawler. Pretty useful. Um, let's see. Let's see. What else, what else in the token creation department? Oh, just any any um, any of the elves that create anthems. Uh, yeah. 
any of the other elf creatures you control get plus one plus one. Elvish Arch Druid, uh, Marwin the Nurturer, Imperious Prefect, Leaf Crown Visionary. I'm just reading off things that I'm seeing on uh, EDH Rec. EDH Rec. Uh, Canopy Tactician. Um, Elvish Promenade will help make more creature t- uh, one one elf tokens. Uh, Lys Elena Huntsmaster. Every time you cast an elf spell, you will create an additional one one elf warrior creature token. That kind of stuff. All right. Uh, actually, Eddie K one two three four five says, "Hey, I just made my eight year old a Lathriel elf token deck. Is that a good starter deck? <sighs> starter? I don't know, but a good deck. Yes. You know what? I think it's. I Token, mean, tokens are fun. Overall, not bad. If you're just make just make tokens, do do thing, make token." Yeah. Get lots of tokens, attack. I think that's a pretty good starter for uh for an 8-year-old. I, I think that's fine. Uh, uh Brandon uh, Mystery Sniper's been uh in and out saying uh doing some mod stuff for us. We want to shout out Mystery Sniper and say Mr. thank Sniper, you. Mystery Sniper, one of the mods as well as a subscriber. TikTok subscriber. Uh TikTok subscriber Brandon Vol jumped in. Wanted to give him a shout out too. Said hi. Our newest subscriber Brandon Vol. All right. Yidus Chris Yidus Christ sixty nine <laughs> says any advice for beginners trying to make a race with D and D and D and D Beyond? Mm. Creating in, a new race, which by the way, they're called they're called lineages. Is it lineage? Species. Speci- is it species? I thought I've, species was. was did what, they what, change it back? I think it was. I think species is what we were want. No, no, we didn't. We want. I wanted ancestries. Ancestry. That's what we wanted. Yeah, I think it is species. That's a dumb word for it. It's very um, primal. Very not, not good. Very clinical. Um, I would. If you're wanting to create your own, I would. Well, it comes down to: is there some kind of creature that you want to be that one of the creatures that exists doesn't represent, or do you want a variant of something that already exists? Like, it's much easier to create a sub race of an elf than it is to create an entire new race. You know, my thought is: do you want it? Is it a mechanical uh, mechanical difference, or is it a flavor difference? If it's a flavor difference, I would say go with either whatever the coolest one you found in in whatever source uh, and just cha- you know, check with your dm say hey can i use instead of this elf can it be a i don't know fire elf i want to be yeah a, or, a, or a space alien i don't care doesn't matter i want to be i want to be um i want to be like the little earth guys in ocarina of time sure the um, mountain the mountain rolly rock dudes you but know. if it's a mechanical difference uh you know that's gonna be honestly just they have, I believe, they have a guide on how to make a mechanically separate lineage or uh, ancestry in in Tasha's. some of the sort in Tasha's, where it's like, okay, here's some, you know, here's some stats you might want to choose. Here's yeah. some uh, abilities that would, you know, choose one of these abilities and two of these abilities, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jive Turkey Punk asks, any AI created D and D? Chat GPT is cool. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's neat. I have no interest in doing it. Especially not AI DMing the way Wizards wants for D&D Beyond. <laughs> as as a person who is more natively a DM, I'm good. Ray Lopez says, "Just wanted to thank you all for uh the content. It's helped me through some dark days." Oh. Ray, we are Ray. happy we are happy to be here uh you know, for you, with you and um around you. And we are, yeah, we're happy that our content can bring you some joy. Absolutely. We're going to keep making it. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank and you. we hope you uh, hope you find what you need. Yeah. And hopefully what you need is some Lord of the Rings magic, because there's going to be a lot of it. There's going to be a lot of it. <laughs> Grimjack says, question, I'm running a wild magic sorcerer druid. Do you have any suggestions for good builds for it? <sighs> Man, charisma, wisdom, constitution interesting it's an interesting spread of stats um concentration spells are going to be your best friend uh especially if you want to do wild shape um i think looking at one of the more spell casty druids would probably do you better uh circle of the stars circle of the land get more access to spells wildfire if you want to lean into the like you you want to, if you want to be like I cast big fire things and then shit happens. Wildfire dru- druid is probably going to be your best bet because your wild shape will create uh, a fire, a small fire elemental basically, and so you'll be able to use your wild shape without having to transform into a creature and then lose access to your spell casting. 
Um, but then you take up the bonus action, so it's like one of the best like sorcery point meta magic things is the quicken spell. So you know, it, you'll need to finesse some of the details a little bit. Um, but I, w- I would probably go with the wildfire druid and the wild magic sorcerer. Hmm. Just go full on pyromaniac. Nice. Uh, Vertigo, 57 asks, where'd you get these uh, MTG poster? That is a displate. Yes. We're not sponsored. We want to be. <laughs> but yeah, displate.com. Yes. They're, they're metal, and they have these really nice uh, magnet panels that you stick to the wall, and then you can swap them out. All right. The MF Rooster says, D&D, one D&D seems like trash. They should have expanded 5th edition not completely change the game when you get an influx of new players. Mm, um, I respectfully disagree. Uh, I think most of the changes that they've been making for 1D&D have been for the better. Streamlining things, standardizing things, making it easier for newer players. Um, was it a change that is entirely necessary? That's I could go one way or the other, depending on the day. Mm. Um, I don't think it's trash. It's just different. Yeah, I think that they have put some things that are very either controversial or just kind of dumb, but they have also come out and said we were doing that purposefully just to see how the community reacts. We want to see where we can go with design in the future. Yeah. Um, and and remember, everything right now is just in playtest. So if you have something you don't like, head out there to uh, when they pop up one of those surveys and let them know. Like Damn. they are they're checking through those, they're reading through those, and they're getting thousands upon thousands of entries. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, if you have a if you have an opinion, it's make the, sure to share it. It's the best way to get get to them if you don't like the direction they're going. Also, for every weird controversial thing that they've put into a one D and D playtest, there's another thing that's like objectively better and awesome. I feel. Oh yeah. So uh, the ga- the the Gavin the Gavin says, I feel like creative influences like Matt Mercer and Brendan Lee off better source material than wizards ever could yeah offer better source material than wizards ever could um that's the great thing about uh third party creators and then influences like matt and brennan is they aren't bound by trying to make money yeah wizards of the coast in hasbro are companies that are trying to make money mm-hmm. brennan lee mulligan and matt mercer are while very successful they're for they're for the creativity yeah. of it. They're happy to be, uh, you know, they're happy to take their job as as dungeon master or as improv artists, as actors, as people to talk yeah. about D anD D, and then not worry about whether or not that's going to make them money. And we talked previously this episode about how most of the Wizards of the Coast adventures and settings they released are just very bland. Because they need to churn out so many of them, and they can't take the time to get into a deeper story, a deeper meaning. That's why one of my, what I think is one of the best adventure books that D and D has published is Call of the Nether Deep, because it they only kind of wrote it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like Curse of Strahd is the only like actual Wizards of the Coast D and D adventure that I think is interesting, and that's just because people made Strahd interesting. Yeah. You know, people simped for Strahd, and things happened. Kind of. Um, let's see. Impish Wolf says, I want uh, more things like Theros and Ravnica. I agree. More Theros would be great. I'm a big fan of the Theros setting. Um, and when I'm um, Impish Wolf, I don't know whether you're talking about D&D or MTG, because both of those oh. are, are both uh, Theros and Ravnica are both uh, MTG both is, both, settings. Both both is both is good. But we'll take both. I'll take both. Uh, Ther- Theros, Greek mythology inspired, but not exactly the same it's so good. There's so much good shit, both in the in the MTG and D and D spheres. Dave the Destroyer says, "Roll for initiative." Eleven. Eighteen. Fuck. Uh, the Gavin. Uh, when we were talking about. Uh, it uh, says they were going. I uh, completely agree. They were just going through the motions. Um, I believe this goes back to when we were talking about the D and D direct and putting it out. Mm-hmm. Um, they need wizards needs to realize when their things are not working. Yeah. 
and D and D and the second year of the D and D direct did not work. Last year's D and D direct was really good. I thought there was a lot of new announcements. They announced one D and D. They had the first play test like ready. They showed a preview of the virtual tabletop. And this year was just kind of like, yeah, all those things last year, we're doing that. Yeah. Also, here's here's a bunch of overpriced uh, action figures and statues to buy, please. Thank you. Um, are you guys going to buy? boxes or by individuals uh this set is just too expensive i assume lord of the rings, lord of the rings. look we like crack and packs we really um, do we don't draft i would like to draft some more but yeah just opening the packs is fun it gives us something to do especially make content out of but That's- as far as it goes if you want a specific card or you want to build, <laughs> build a deck buy singles yeah buying singles is the most cost effective way to get the cards you want because you get to decide what cards you want that being said we always do the pre-release kits. We usually do two each, uh, just as a good way to get a base of a set. Um, with the Lord of the Rings set, I'm probably going to be getting three, four plus just for me, <laughs> uh, in addition to the two that I that uh, Sam will be getting. But when it comes to like, we usually when it's a set that we like, we've gotten the set booster box for it. Yeah, like all will be one was. That was a- a- Super set. Cool. We're really into that set, so we got a set booster box for it. Dominary Remastered. It's a cool set. We got the booster box for it. Also, now that we do live streams all the time, it's another way to make content. Um, it's a way that we we didn't really take the opportunity when we opened the All Will Be One set, uh, but taking the live stream and trying to chop it up into individual pack opening uh, shorts would probably be a good idea, too. But... Uh, with wanting to try and collect as many of the Lord of the Rings cards as possible, I mean, I, I you're gonna, I'm gonna buy a lot of cards. You're gonna, you know, crack and packs. If you just want to buy, uh, collect as many as possible. Yeah, collect, you know, crack the packs, get what you need, sell the shaft. Yeah, uh, for sure, and that's what I'm going to. I'm, it's in June. I'm going to be getting as many packs as I can. Um, would love to get one of the bundles just to have the box to put the cards in because <laughs> I'm like that. Um, and then we'll be going to Gen Con in August and we already are going to go through a bunch of our cards and getting out a bunch of them to find a vendor that's willing to go through all of them and offer a trade in value and probably buy more magic cards with that trade in value <laughs> when we're at Gen Con. Uh, let's see. Daniel Sun 19932 asks, do you have do you all do you have any Yu-Gi-Oh or One Punch Man cards at all? Yes, uh, I have I have a small collection of old Yu-Gi-Oh cards from when I was a kid. That's about it. I've looked through it, and there's nothing too valuable. There's some cards that are like fifteen, twenty bucks, but that's about it. Kaza Glue six 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 says, "What do you think of a thirteen-headed Hydra Dragon Xenomorph creature?" Ew! Sounds terrifying. Do yeah. it. Make it a false Hydra too. <laughs> uh, dear, uh, if you our... don't know what a false Hydra is, look into it because it is terrifying. Uh, one of uh, one of our favorite uh, TikTok creators and dad of the of D and D TikTok, Papa Lichen. Oh, daddy! Uh, yells at us. Click clank. Here comes the tank, baby. Which barbarian subclass is the best? I think I think I, I think it's kind of everyone is in agreement, or at least a lot of people are in agreement. It's the totem of the bear. Totem of the bear is is is. I mean, it gives you resistance to everything but psychic damage. Yeah. And then you cross that with, you know, you cross that with like a druid and suddenly you have a, you have a wild shaping bear that's resistant to everything except uh, circle of the moon druid with three to five levels of totem with the bear barbarian is a singularly unique build that is very powerful. Second, the, the totem of the bear barbarian, I feel like, is first with a somewhat close second being the zealot barbarian. Zealot barbarian is pretty good, especially if you have very, um, very high levels with, high the, levels with the rage beyond death. Yes. Cool. And, and very, yeah. Um, Kolbs302 asks, is Ghost Malone I, uh, <laughs> going to end up with the one ring? Is Post Malone going to end up with Probably. one ring? Probably. Uh, you know, maybe him, maybe Cassius Marsh. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, add those to the list of people that you contact if you find the one ring. <laughs> if you find the one of one one ring, like your life changes the moment you crack that card. Oh yeah, I feel. Because the moment especially even if it's not legit because there's going to be people that are going to fake it. There's going to be people that are faking it. Oh yeah, we're going to do that. This point we're going to get that Willy Wonka. The last the one ring has been found and then it's, the one ring has been found. And it's like, "Oh, 
People are going to proxy the shit out of that. Oh. Put it, reseal a pack, open it. Oh my god, I found the one ring. Yeah, especially you can make really nice proc like you can you can take foil Magic the Gathering cards, use acetone to remove the printing of it which leaves the foiling and then certain printers you can send the card right through and print whatever you want onto it. Yep. Which is unbelievably cool by the way. So cool. But hilarious, and people are absolutely going to be making oh, their own one of one one rings. I, uh, you know, what we should do, do that, do and that, then do a whole pack of them. <laughs> oh my god, the one of one ring! Oh my god, a second one of one ring! That, that would be oh, where's where's a piece? Well, let's write that down. <laughs> <laughs> just pro, just create, just create like twelve proxies of it, and then all right, what's the token? A one of one, one ring is the token. <laughs> a token, one of one of one ring. I couldn't, I couldn't in good faith, like actually do a fake one. But if we're doing it like that, then for absolutely, we have to go that. over the top with it. <laughs> it's like we pulled ten one of one, one rings in this collector booster. <laughs> uh, let's see. The Gavin says, "I want to believe that whoever gets the one ring will slowly, it will slowly consume them." I mean, that's thematically appropriate. I want to. I, I think that uh, whoever gets the one of one ring should slowly consume it. Oh, just eat it? Just over one live. Like just... like the bigger, blacker lotus? Yeah. <laughs> just rip. Eat. Oh, I fucking... Oh, I hate... I hate that... This card is going to either never see the light of day, or it's going to be destroyed for a Mr. Beast video or Logan Paul or something. Oh, that'd be... Whoever finds it. Whoever finds it. Because I'm telling you right now, if I pulled the one of one one wearing, the only thing I would be doing for the next week is contacting every Magic the Gathering and big name YouTuber that cares about collectible trading cards um, to be like, hey, I fucking got it and I can get it graded and prove that it is is what it is, I'm saying it is. And then you make your rounds, you make your YouTube channel, you get your socials, they blow up to like a million, and you're you can do whatever the fuck you can do whatever the fuck you want at that point. <laughs> and that is the end of the the that's the end of the questions and comments we have right, on well, the TikTok Live. This has been a I expect this to be a little bit of a shorter podcast episode, and it seems it is not. No, and we get a solid a solid hour twenty six right now in the recording software, but Again, if you enjoyed this podcast, you can check us out. We record it live on the TikTok. You can follow our TikTok account if you don't. Over 32,000 of you already do. We have Monday Night Magic live streams as well, in addition to our regular TikTok content. You can subscribe to us on the YouTube, where over 700 people do now. Same as we're making some cool D&D and Magic the Gathering rules shorts. Those are also available on the Instagram that he runs. You can and follow that's us. also over 750 people as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. Look at you. We're growing, look, guys. Look, look at you. Look at you. Look at you. Look at yourself. You can also uh, follow us on podcast services around the globe. Apple, Google, Spotify, microwave ovens. Um, um, the Acer. gurgling of a large man's belly on the bus next to you. Uh, he swallowed his phone. That's all that was. Um, it's not sitting well. No, it, it does, the, the, I, all the cobalt in it just does not. It's very upsetting to the stomach. <laughs> If you want, if you want to be really depressed, look up Cobalt Mines. Ooh, it's sad. Um, <laughs> anyway, be said. Well, that's a great note to end on. So, uh, thank you guys. We appreciate you. And uh, in the meantime, peace.